AI did not take over QE jobs. And a lot of people actually got job offers recently. I was one of them, and I'm about to share the interview questions and answers I got while getting my job offer. Who are you? My name is Valerie, and I'm a QA engineer who recently got a job offer in the United States. And I'm about to share the interview questions and answers I had. That's cool, but how did you get into QA? This video is about interview questions and answers, but if you want to hear my full QA story, drop the comment below, share your QA story, and I will record one. And now let's move on to the interview questions and answers people are really wondering about. All right, all yours, but make sure to remind these people to hit this big fat thumb up button below, subscribe to our channel, and also join our Instagram and Italian Room communities where we share many more updates that we can legally share here and the links for them are you right you can find me right here the first question is what is the difference between javascript and typescript javascript is dynamically typed which means you only see type errors when you actually run the code and that often leads to unexpected bugs. TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript that adds optional static typing, so errors are caught on compilation instead of at runtime. This makes your code easier to debug, read, and maintain, especially when projects or test automation grow larger. In my opinion, TypeScript has a better IDE support like autocomplete, navigation, refactoring tools, because the tools understand the code you write more deeply. The only trade-off that comes is that JavaScript runs directly, while TypeScript needs to be compiled to JavaScript. But that compilation step is exactly what helps us to catch mistakes early and ensure the code base is reliable and easy to maintain. The second question is, how do you handle flaky tests in your test automation? The answer is easy. I find them and I destroy them. Just kidding. When I run into a flaky test, I don't just rerun it. I look for the root cause. Most of the time, it is timing issues, async calls, or weak locators. For test automation, I use Playwright. And in Playwright, I avoid wait for timeout. Instead, I rely on its auto-waiting and assertions like to have text, to be visible, to ensure that actions happen only when the elements are ready. I also keep my tests isolated. No shared setup between tests. At most, I do one or two retries to understand the pattern, not to hide the real issues. In general, in my framework, I follow the best practices, which help me to avoid flackiness, like page object model, fixtures, and regularly refactor brittle selectors. So my goal is simple. The test should only fail if it is a real product bug, not because the test itself is unstable. The next question is, can you explain how would you perform a cross-browser testing using automation? For cross-browser testing, I start by deciding which browsers should be covered. Usually the most popular ones like Chromium, Firefox, or WebKit. For test automation, I use Playwright, so the setup is pretty easy. I just navigate to the config file, create a project for each browser, and then run the tests in parallel for each browser. I try to make my tests browser agnostic, so I prefer to use stable locators like get by role instead of brittle selectors. And in CI, I capture traces and uh, screen recordings, so if something fails, I would easily investigate if the issue is browser related. By the way, I'm not sure if you guys are enjoying this girl or not, but I just wanted to remind you that a lot of people from this YouTube channel 
have asked me to help them to improve their English and their pronunciation as they want to become tech professionals, but English is not their native language. So especially for people like you, I did open up this YouTube channel where you can learn and improve your English and particularly articulation completely for free. You can find the link right there. Let's continue. The next question is, what's your experience with accessibility testing? I approach accessibility testing in two ways, manual and automation. For automation, I use Playwright and Ax Playwright library, which helps me to catch issues like poor color contrast, missing alt text, or invalid area rows really fast. I always try to back up automation with manual testing, so I make sure the page can be navigating only by keyboard. I test if our page can be usable with screen readers like voiceover to make sure that the product can be experienced by people who rely on assistive tech. Automation is great. It helps us to ensure a good test coverage and speed up testing process. But manual testing shows whether our product is can be truly usable by everyone. Next question is, how do you prioritize testing across multiple projects? When working across multiple projects, I prioritize based on risks, deadlines, and resources. I make sure the highest severity and time-sensitive tasks are covered first. After that, I expand to lower priority tasks. I also try to break my work into time blocks, so I stay focused on one project at a time instead of switching back and forth. Communication is key, so I regularly sync with my team to make sure priorities are aligned and expectations are clear. The next question is, tell us about a time you had a challenge in test automation and how did you overcome it? One challenge I had in test automation was dealing with flaky tests. Sometimes tests would fail, sometimes they would pass, which made it hard for the team to trust automation results. My task was to figure out why it was happening and stabilize our test suite. I investigated by reviewing the failing tests logs, checking the CI run patterns and comparing the behavior across local and environments. That showed me that the main problem was unstable environment and timing issues. To fix timing issues, I avoided hard weights and instead I relied on smart weights, as well as I refactored brittle selectors to stable locators. A lot of our tests were relying on external services, so we decided to mock data to make our tests deterministic. So if the failure happened, it pointed out to the real issue in the code instead of some random hiccups or dependencies. As a result, the flakiness of our test suite reduced from around 20% to less than 3%. We sped up our release process as well as testing. We also reduced time wasted on investigating false failures. And we regained, we regained the trust to the test automation results. The next question is, how do you select a test case for automation? When deciding which test case to automate, I follow a few criteria. First, I look at high risk and critical flows where errors would have the biggest impact. So when it will be automated, we will catch the errors earlier. Secondly, I look at the test cases that are repeatable, are part of regression or smoke suite, as well as time consuming test cases. I prefer to wait with automation if a a feature, a test case is still under active development and requirements change frequently. Once it is stable, it could be automated. The goal is to add automation where, where it saves time and adds value and still keep manual testing where it is, where it is more effective. 
By the way, one year ago, I wasn't even sure if I want to learn from Sergey and Kademify Bootcamp, but I decided to give it a try and signed up for free one week. And I realized I actually loved the way they teach. Practical experience in the US-based startup from day one, that sounds amazing. And 136 rounds of interview prep is actually what helped me to get a job. So if you are in the same spot as me, do not hesitate, sign up for one week and try it out. All right, let's continue. And the last question is, tell us how do you handle situations when you find a bug and the developer tells you it is not a bug? First of all, I check the documentation and requirements to make sure I didn't misunderstand anything. After that, I review my bug report to make sure steps to reproduce actual and expected results are clear and bug is reproducible. The other important step is making sure that I didn't miss any important attachments or logs in my bug report that help to understand the issue better. And if the developer still disagrees, I am always open to communication. I'm trying to understand their point of view because there might have been some changes that I am not aware of. And if it is now valid by design, I update the ticket or even close it after the discussion with my team. But if according to the requirements, documentation, and uh, further communication, it is indeed a valid bug and the developer still disagrees. I try to explain from the user point of view why it should be fixed, why it is important. And if the misunderstanding continues, I escalate the issue to my project manager or QA manager to make sure it gets the right attention. But most of the time, clear communication helps me to fix and resolve any misunderstandings without escalation. Well, this was the first video for this girl on this YouTube channel. And I would love you guys to quietly let me know in the comments below if you did like it or if you did not. And why exactly you did or you did not. Thank you. Get some water, get some workout, get a really good nap. And I'll see you on the next video.